with demand expected to come back. The question remains, does this mean the economy is back on track? Companies now, after experimenting with offshore in places like India, Philippines, and Poland, want to bring those jobs back. We invest in the U.S. We're the biggest exporter in the country. In the cycle and right now, we're creating jobs. From Radio America, it's Neil Asbury's Made in America, the show that explores American industry, large and small, and promotes American-made products everywhere. Put Neil Asbury's Made in America to work for you. A very big welcome to you today. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Ruffin. So, Rich, just when you thought the Democrat primary could not get any wackier, we have Tom Steyer now joining the field. And uh, a man who, uh, a billionaire, a uh, billionaire white guy, yeah. you know, coming in to this very, very diverse group of Democrat candidates. And, uh, you know, the, the thing that's really, uh, we've talked a, a lot about him. And, you know, remember the Keystone Pipeline and all the uh, advocacy he was doing against that. and and uh, But here's a guy who's made... Millions and millions of dollars on on fossil fuels. Right, because you play both sides. You play both sides. A a huge investor in coal, but in China, where, by the way, they have all these dirty coal uh, power generation plants. No scrubbers. uh, Amazing. Isn't that that strange? Well, listen, first, I... I, I, Not coal in our country. Not our our coal miners. Of course not. We can't do that. Not our coal miners. No, no, no. We can't do that. So, uh, no, no, no. I, I just find it amazing that here here is a guy that played both sides of the coin. But what's even better is that, you know, wasn't it recently in this last week that Pelosi said that uh, making America white again? Well, wait a minute. Last I looked, Tom Stiers is a white guy. And the uh, guy who's leading the pack. And uh, I'm just a little confused right now. Right now, Joe Biden's still still there. I, don't, I doubt that he's going to be there uh, much longer. I, I don't think he's going to last the distance. But... You know, very, very weird. Very, very bizarre. Yeah, yeah, no, but, uh, terrible. You know, and here's uh, Tom Sawyer, you know, he's kind of made his whole advocacy on, well, two things, impeaching uh, President Trump. Yeah. And um, I guess that's not going anywhere, at least now. And, and climate change. But I guess we're supposed to just look the other way when it comes to his investment in fossil fuels. And particularly his investment in China. One of the biggest polluters on the on the face of the earth, and I don't know if you've been to Beijing uh, lately, but your eyes water. You know, you start coughing immediately because of uh, you know because of this uh, yellow dust or yellow wind, which is this really toxic formation of um, of of. Of, of fossil fuels, of, of, of burning coal. You know, most of the electric in, in China comes from uh, from electric uh, generation, uh, coal, coal plants coal, generating coal their electric. Fired, coal-fired plants. You know, 1950 technology, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and here this is mixing up with this, this dust and everything, and it creates a real a real health problem over there, which is now which is now being blown over to to Korea, Japan, Hong Kong. I mean, and in fact, we could see traces of it in California. That's how far it reaches. And this this is a guy who who invests in that and now coming over here and say, hey, look, we need we need a a, a green uh, uh, energy economy. And, you know, what's the cost of that? Do you know what the cost of that is? We're going to talk about that right now with James Taylor from the Heartland Institute. He's a senior fellow for environment and energy policy. James, welcome to Made in America. Hey, thanks for having me on. So uh, the hypocrisy in, 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 in our government, or, or at least people who, run around, who want to run our government, is absolutely astounding. And, and it's really this whole thing about the, the, the Green New Deal and, and going 100 percent to renewable energy in the United States. And we've got to do that. And we've got to do that by, by 2030 or the world's going to end. I don't think we even have 12 years left. The days are ticking by. And uh, Florida is going to disappear and, you know, all of these different uh, uh, problems. Cats and dogs sleeping together. It's terrible. <laughs> but what is the cost of this? I mean, can we can we hang a number on it? And, uh, you know, I've I seen uh, in, in something that was actually published by your organization is four point five trillion as sort of like a down payment over the next 10 years or thirty five thousand dollars per household. Right. Well, we can certainly make some some good educated guesses. Uh, much of what is being required, if you switch over to 100% renewable energy, uh, you know the technology hasn't been tried yet. 
So we're using our, our best estimate based upon what things cost now and what we project. But there have been three uh, pretty good estimates on this topic in the past few months. Uh, the first one was by the American Action Forum, and they estimated that uh, transferring to 100% renewable would be $5.7 trillion. Uh, the one that you mentioned uh, that we published on our website from Wood McKenzie estimates $4.5 trillion. Now, before I get to the third one, I'm sure listeners' eyes are glossing over billions, trillions, what does it mean to me? $4.5 trillion, that's the second one, that's the lower estimate, is $35,000 per household. So if you feel like paying $35,000, it's worth it to you, then let's go ahead. And by the way, the third analysis is one that I wrote myself uh, for the Heartland Institute. And, and I think mine is more accurate because I'm factoring in the cost of building out uh, the new transmission lines that are required for wind and solar because you can't just put them down where you have a coal or natural gas power plant. We're also factoring the cost of building national high-speed rail because the Green New Deal bans uh, airplanes and, and you can't run airplanes on wind and solar power. And also talks and also incorporates uh, the cost of power sta- power stations for electric cars, which are ignored in the other two. And with that, what we're looking at is a cost of approximately thirteen trillion dollars, or one hundred thousand dollars per household. So if you if you have an extra hundred thousand dollars to spare in your household, maybe you'll feel good about uh, the Green New Deal or going one hundred percent renewable. Rich, Rich, I think that's more <laughs> what James just said. I think that's more accurate the number. I mean, uh, thirteen trillion, right? Because got to get rid of the airplanes. Hi, and, and and how how long would it take us to do all of this? I mean, this is a massive well, amount well, of infrastructure we're talking wait a minute, about. Let's think about this for a second. You know, before we get totally nuts, which basically we are, we're going to take the entire concept of energy in the United States as we've known it with over a 100 years of experience, technology, work, development, and so forth, all the labor going into it. It's taken us to this point that we can actually get energy and be self-sufficient. We're going to say, thanks, but no thanks, we can't do that. So we're going to totally upheld the entire concept of everything we're using right now, which I find to be astounding. It's not just the question of the $35,000 more. It's probably going to be a lot more than that because you're going to have to do things to your homes. But people, as pointed out in some of these studies that James has been referring to, yet, well, what about air conditioning? Can we do that? What about heating? Can we do that? What about pumping water? Can we do that? What about the technology for medical and so forth? Can we do that? So what, 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 what James is referring to is that I think the real cost to this is absolutely way beyond what we're talking about right now because we don't know how to get there. But we're going to have to get there sooner than later because it's going to end in 12 years. Where do we go from here, and how do we make it happen? Basically, we can't. We can, can't we, James? And, and, and I don't even think that the Democrats think that we can. Yeah, and if I can add one thing. Now, this is just the cost of switching to 100% renewable energy. If we were to take uh, Representative Ocasio-Cortez's Green New Deal, which entails much more than that, it entails audits of buildings, it entails uh, revamping buildings if they're not energy efficient, it entails giving... Uh, well-paying, quote, living wage jobs to anybody who wants one in the renewable energy industry. All sorts of other factors there. My analysis, if we incorporate those factors, so if we go beyond it and take what Ocasio-Cortez wants to do, the cost now becomes approximately $100 trillion, and now you're getting close to a $1 million per household. It's just absolutely unbelievable and, and just unfeasible. Uh, totally correct. I mean, if you think about this, you know, I, I read it in the article that you, that you uh, put forward is that it would take to to academically, that's, which means it doesn't exist in the real world. Acad- <laughs> well, I taught college. It doesn't exist in the real world. So academically, if you think about it, it would take, according to what I just read before, three at least 300 square miles of wind plants to do something that would be able to function and make this country work. Can you comprehend that? Because I've driven on 10 coming back from California at times, and I've seen the windmill farms out there that are unbelievable. It goes on and on and on and on and on, and then you see on the ground all the carved animals that have made a mistake of going into that. So I just find this whole, this is just amazing. This is Rod Serling on steroids. You, you make a great point because the political left has tried to hijack the conversation of what is environmentalism. And in their mind, it's defined solely by emissions, carbon dioxide emissions. 
But in reality, wind turbines are tremendously harmful to the environment. As you mentioned, it requires 300 square miles of wind turbines to replace a single coal power plant. If you like land conservation, if you like land available for wildlife, for scenic vistas, forget about it. But it's not just that. Wind turbines right now, while providing just a small percentage of our electricity, kill 1.5 million birds and bats every year in this country, including many protected and endangered species. Moreover, wind turbines and solar panels require a significant amount of rare earth minerals. And rare earth minerals, they call them that not because they're necessarily rare, but because they don't run in veins or concentrated deposits like iron ore or coal. They're, they're spread out. And you have to mine a tremendous amount of earth to get just a few of these. Hey, James, let's further, uh, let's further dive into that. Uh, we just got to take a quick break. We're, we're talking to James Taylor from the Heartland Institute. Very, very fascinating discussion about America's energy policy. So important to your job. You don't want to miss it. Right back with James Taylor. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Ruffman. And we're talking with James Taylor from the Heartland Institute. He's a senior fellow for Environment and Energy Policy. So, James, the, the, the political situation in the United States, especially in the Democrat Party, on the presidential side, I don't believe in Congress. I mean, there's a lot of members of the House that's gotten elected in Republican-leaning districts who definitely, this has got to be anathema to them, you know, seeing their presidential candidates up on the stage, you know, up one-upping each other on the Green New Deal and what they're willing to do to this economy uh, in order to restructure it into a renewable uh, energy uh, uh, economy in a very, very short period of time. And how disruptive that would be to just about every American, and certainly very, very expensive, and how many jobs would we kill, and what that would do overall to the health of our country, the prosperity of our country. It's it's absolutely amazing. And now with Tom Steyer, we talked about it, Rich and I, earlier in the show, with him jumping in, and can you imagine him at, at, at the next debate, if he gets into the debate, about, you know, it's all going to be about, it's all going to be about the Green New Deal. It's all going to be about climate change. It's going to all be about destruct, uh, destroying, decimating the fossil fuel industry and moving on to something that we don't even know what it is. It's never been proven. You know, so, so what is the pol- uh, political calculus? Uh, read the tea leaves for us. Well, certainly if some proposal is too far to the left for Nancy Pelosi. It should be cause for concern. Uh, Nancy Pelosi has panned the uh, Green New Deal proposal as the green dream or whatever, as she puts it, uh, because she realizes this is something that either would be completely unfeasible or, if you implemented it, would completely destroy the American economy. But the problem is this, and this is a real threat, even though you may have Nancy Pelosi and, and others who, even on the far left, realize that this is ruinous and devastating. The Democratic Party keeps going further and further to the left, especially on these uh, environmental issues. And keep in mind that if you are Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, if you're Bernie Sanders, if you're any of the other socialists in the Democratic Party, which are more and more inching closer to a majority in that party, how do you implement socialism? You don't implement socialism with a capitalist economy doing well and being very popular. You implement socialism by destroying the capitalist economy. And a good way to destroy it is to impose programs like the Green New Deal that are so expensive uh, that the American people can't pay for it. The economic system breaks down and then voila, you have socialism to implement in its place. Well, you have no choice then because you have to survive. So to survive, we'll do anything we can so you can give us, give us, please give us the water. Please give us the heat. Please give us the food. So you'll do whatever you have to do with the majority of the folks because that's the way it's going to have to go down. You know, this is an, a, really an amazing thing. And you, 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 you can't even pretend, Neil and, and, and James, to pretend that you're going to be an MOR candidate, a middle-of-the-road candidate, right now. Oh, we're going to get close to the election. We're going to figure out who it is. And they're going to go from the far left to the middle because that's what everyone says you have to do. You can't be far to the left. can't be far to the right. You have to be more in the middle and capture the rest of America. We can't even do that because if the Democrats do that with their candidate that gets a, you know, nominated to run against the, the current president, it's going to blow the party apart. 
So then what do you do with all those people who are, who are saying, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're supposed to be going far to the left. We're getting someone who's saying they're going to be to the left and then to go into the middle of the road. This isn't going to work. It's not going to work for Bernie, whose number one asset, when he, if he gets to be the president, is to start the revolution. It can't work. So we have, we have such a catch-22 for the Democratic Party that it's almost laughable when you think about it. And what's really strange, James, which, by the way, it's a great name, by the way, James Taylor, just... I thought Thank Fire you. and Ice was a great song. But um, that you can't even go back to pre-industrial age because under the Green New Deal, you can't have cows. They don't like horses, can't have manure. So you can't even go back to a pre-industrial age in this fantasy that's going forward. Uh, you know, I almost see a catch-22 for the Democratic Party. What do you think? I think so. And, and I want to bring up one other point because this is something we'll often hear in an attempted rebuttal of the real costs of the Green New Deal or going 100 percent renewable even without the Green New Deal. Uh, more and more, the uh, political left and the environmental left are claiming that wind and solar power are just as uh, affordable and perhaps uh, less expensive than conventional energy. And it is complete hogwash. Uh, there is a report that was just released yesterday by the United Nations. It shows that globally investment in wind and solar power uh, was down uh, 11% last year. That's even with governments subsidizing them left and right. And the fact is that when people try to claim wind and solar power are cost competitive, it's because they're factoring in the government subsidies. They're not factoring the cost of building all the expensive transmission lines to reach the wind and solar facilities. They're not factoring the cost of batteries, which we don't even have the technology yet, but assuming we did, you'd have to have substantial expensive batteries to store the energy for nighttime when the sun isn't shining, for cloudy days, etc. But we know in the real world that there is no country in which you see wind and solar power taking off or becoming a majority. It's not because every single country in the world is run by idiots. It's because it's substantially more expensive than conventional energy. And so you'll have people on the left that'll drum up their studies, paid for or conducted by the Solar Energy Industry Association or others. But in the real world, we know, and in, in analysis after analysis after analysis, it is tremendously more expensive to go to wind and solar power. Hey, James, say, uh, uh, you've been a great guest. We really appreciate you being on the show. Very insightful. James Taylor from the Heartland Institute. James, come back and join us real, uh, again real soon. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Coming up, we have James Contero from the Texas Public Policy Foundation. So when starting a business, you need to pick a state. So what state should you start a business? That's what we're going to talk about. You don't want to miss it. Made in America. higher at the open, stocks continued to perform well over the course of the day Tuesday. And I think that bodes well here over the next couple of years for having bigger demands coming to this country. Now, more of Neil Asbury's Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman. So, Rich, energy, I mean, it's such a very, very vitally important thing. Could you imagine, you know, you and I, you know, we experienced the 1970s. And remember those long lines? Oh, and sure. Odd and even days oh, yeah. of when you can buy yeah. gas. Well, the good news is we had Jimmy Carter in the White House, and he got that under control right away. He <laughs> really had good things. You know what I find amazing about that? He was actually, you know, trained to be a nuclear scientist. That's how we wound up on the nuclear submarine. And yet he went way over his head, had no idea what to do with this thing. And, and amazing. Ran around in circles. Because remember, I mean, the, the world was running out of energy. I mean, it was just all well, going to be gone. It wasn't yeah. going to be. Fo I mean, it was it was far running out of energy. And then and then the Middle just East saying. and the embargo how, and all of that. How and, we didn't see what you know, was coming. America, you know, we didn't have energy resources. They were dwindling. They were depleting. And then all of a sudden, you know, look at this economy today. We, we're, we're energy independent. We're an energy exporting nation. We have more reserves than anybody. I mean, at least we could get to them. We have the technology to be able to get it out of the ground and do it cheaply and, by the way, responsibly and create millions of jobs. I mean, very good paying jobs and, and everything that it does for our, for our economy, our citizens, our businesses. You know, amazing. I mean, we are so blessed in this country. Well, you know what makes me feel comfortable? 
That when, I mean, we were talking about Jimmy Carter in the 70s when the, the disaster occurred the first time with OPEC, the formation of OPEC. Mm-hmm. All right. So Jimmy Carter says, well, you know, we're running out of energy and everyone throws their hands up. They're running around in circles and run into a wall. Just a few years ago when President Obama was involved and he said, well, you're not going to drill your way out of this one. Well, well, I'm so glad that the Democrats have amazing foresight and understanding and how to deal with problems and not even and understanding where the resources are, which, by the way, are the American citizens. Just saying. Well, it was, if you recall, Jimmy Carter saying, oh, we got to tighten our belts. You know, we're going to have to give up a lot. You know, our lives are going to be very different. We're not going to be able to go on vacations like we wanted to in the past. We're going to have to stay much more local. And then it was Ronald Reagan who said, hey, look, the best days are yet ahead of us. We don't have to do all of that. We're America. We can we can invent our way out of this. You know what? I, we, the economic freedom, let's pursue that, that very basic freedom. Allow the entrepreneurs of America to be successful, in, and we'll solve all problems. You know, I and just, by the way, we did. I just thought of something, Neil. It was in the days of Jimmy Carter. What did Jimmy Carter do? His brother made beer. <laughs> Billy Beer. Billy Beer. Wait a minute. I think there's something there. Because <laughs> Obama had beer summits. Do you think there's something there that we should be talking about? I don't know, man. I don't know. This is very scary stuff. No, you, you're the, 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 the conspiracy <laughs> guy. I think there is a conspiracy there. Hey, but let's talk about starting a business. Economic freedom. Economic freedom. Unleashing the power of the American entrepreneur, the inventor, the risk taker. So if you're going to start a business, where are you going to start a business? If you have the opportunity to pick a state, what state would that be? Let's bring on right now James Quintero from the Texas Public Policy Foundation. James, welcome to Made in America. Hey, Neil. It's good to be with you guys. Uh, Rich, pleasure to meet you as well. Sounds like you guys have had a day full of Jameses from free market. <laughs> yeah. You know, this is so great. We, we don't have to change James names Taylor whatsoever. On. We had James Taylor on just before. <laughs> but, uh, but no, hey, James, it's really great to have you. And uh, we're talking about energy. So you can't talk about energy without talking about Texas and all the wonderful things that you do down there and uh, making our country prosperous and, and, and giving us affordable energy so our businesses can thrive. So once you got this affordable energy and, you know, now we're an in, in energy sufficient uh, 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 country, you know, we Net can, provide, exporter we can provide for our own needs, which is absolutely amazing. So now you have that huge opportunity to go out and start a business. Great time to start a business. So where should we start a business? Now, you're from the Texas Public Policy Foundation. I I bet you have an idea where you should start a business. So why Texas? Well, so great question. You know, if you want to roll up your sleeves and invest your capital, there's no better state than Texas. And uh, I I think it's fairly uh, well known that Texas is the absolute gold standard for for small businesses and entrepreneurs and i was really excited to see wallet hub come out here recently and and say that texas is the best state for business you also had cnbc calling texas the uh, top state for business in 2018 we got dinged a little bit in yesterday's rankings they they ranked us number two right behind virginia but we're still right right up at the top and of course ceo magazine has listed us as the top state for business for 15 years in a row, right? And so uh, I, I think it's, it's fairly well known that Texas is the place to be, and so which, which raises the question, well, why? Why is it that Texas is doing so well? And, and from my perspective, at least, I, I think the answer is pretty simple. We keep taxes low, regulations light, and government small. And by doing those simple things, we've been able to absolutely uh, transform the state into America's economic engine. And it has been so absolutely rewarding to watch the transformation from up close and, uh, and have some small impact on that. You know, we, uh, we just concluded a, a, a pretty tough legislative session. Uh, Texas is one of those unique states that has a biennial legislature that meets once every other year for 140 days and so we just wrapped up our session and uh true to form our our lawmakers did really well to not only talk the talk but also walk the walk when it comes to conservative government and uh, a couple of the big things that they did we uh we had a 5.1 billion dollar tax relief package passed by the legislature it's going to really i think uh, further jumpstart the small business environment. A lot of folks are uh, are, are feeling the, the pinch of property taxes around here. It's going to be a really good spur. 
we also limited the growth of future taxes. So uh, beginning here soon, uh, in January 2020, cities and counties are going to have to go and ask voters for permission before they can raise property taxes by more than 3.5%. For school districts, it's even lower. It's at 2.5%. So really tightening the reins on the growth of taxes, which, again, I think are going to help businesses. And then lastly, this is kind of funny, Believe it or not, uh, Texas has a, a few nanny staters, particularly at the local level, who like to try to micromanage the business environment. And uh, one of the things that, that we saw was there's actually some cities and neighborhood associations who were uh, both banning and requiring a permit for uh, children who wanted to operate a lemonade stand. And so... Uh, one of the things that the legislature did this time was was they kind of, uh, well, they preempted those ordinances. So if you're a small entrepreneur and you want to open a lemonade stand, you are more than welcome to now. <laughs> Very good. Hey, James, we've got to take a quick break. We're talking to James Quintero from the Te- uh, Texas Public Policy Foundation. We're talking about states and which state uh, is creating the environments for your success. You don't Where want to miss you it. want to be. That's right. Stick with us. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman. And we're being joined by James Quintero from the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And we're talking about which states are creating the environment for you to be successful when you when you declare your entrepreneurial dream. So, James, I mean, looking at the 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 wallet hub um, rankings of the best states, Texas was number one. Um, Utah was number two. Georgia, number three. North Dakota, number four. Oklahoma, number five. And Florida, Florida, uh, number number six. But, you know, I, I don't see a state on here that, you know, they're way down on the bottom. South Carolina. You know, you've got a lot of great companies moving to South Carolina. Tennessee is not in the top ten. And you hear a lot about Tennessee and how they're so aggressive in, in, uh, in attracting business. Why aren't they not on the list? Great question. So, you know, I, I think it's a combination of different things. And the way that Wall of Hub kind of structured their uh, indices was they looked at the business environment, access to resources, and business costs. And I would say we, we fairly well cleaned up on two of the three of those metrics. And so I think when you combine all of those different elements, you get a little bit different rankings. Where I thought we did particularly well is in the uh, business environment ranking. Uh, and again, I think the, the legislature deserves a lot of credit for for uh, moving the state in this direction. They've really done well when it comes to keeping state and local government uh, spending in line and also the cost of government via property taxes mainly uh, in line as well. Uh, so, so they've really been able to foster a business-friendly environment that's attractive to uh, folks fleeing states like California, Illinois, but, and, and, New York. And, 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 let's, let's stop that, that there for a second, James, and, and I'm bringing Rich now. Is that California, unbelievable, is number eight on this list. And how That's in the world did they get to into me. the top ten? I mean, this state is so messed up. I mean, it is so so wacky with all of its regulations and taxes. Okay, they got a lot of smart people out there. I get that. But the cost of doing business in the overtaxation, the regulation, the well, nanny state, the talk anti-business about the nanny state. environment coming from, from you know the and, governor's office down is outrageous. And rich, and rich, and I know that a lot of California companies are going to where Texas. Go, go, yeah. Texas and, and and they're going to right to work states. So there I do is. find you know right when you look work. at South Carolina, Tennessee, and so forth, you have plants like BMW, Volkswagen. I mean, the biggest BMW plant in the world is in a right to work state. Boeing selected South Carolina. That's right. So yeah. I, I am, I am I, and James, I'm really, I am really stunned that that South Carolina and those others aren't farther up because they are attracting an awful lot. But I have to ask you a question. With all that we're talking sure. about right now, and I agree with you, I think Texas, I've done a lot of business in Texas. I know, Neil, you really, pro, you like Texas a lot. It's a great state. Uh, but there is a fight going on right now politically for Texas. Texas, if Texas can be turned purple and blue, 
and they put that in that order. It's very hard uh, for a Republican to get elected at a very high office at the presidency. They need Texas. So there's this big fight going on. So when I do business in Houston, which I love Houston. It's a great city. It's a very energy city, of all things. And I was there for what I was doing with my magazines. But Houston's a left-leaning city. Dallas, kind Austin. of a left. Oh, you beat me oh, to it. I hate when that. You know, I got to raise my hand like the kids in fifth grade, and the other guy gets it, and you don't get. It, you're raising it, right? Yeah, Austin. So you know, it's James. James too. He raised his hand, and the other kid shouted it out. But but the point is, James, how do we deal with that? How do you see dealing with that in Texas? You've got so much going for you in Texas, and yet, if it if how do you stop this bluing? Well, you're absolutely right. So when you think of Texas. A lot of folks think of a deeply red state, and in some sense that's correct, at least when you look at state government, where the, where the diversion really comes into play is at the local level. Uh, even though here in Texas we have uh, nonpartisan local elections, it's very evident that the left has captured all of these various offices. And they're using this particular platform at the local level to push big government ideas. And so you have this tremendous clash between the state government and all of these various liberal local governments, which tend to be your your bigger urban areas, you know, your San Antonio, Dallas, Austin. These folks are are, are very progressive, very outspoken, and uh, they have some really bad ideas. And so where I think conservatives have done well is to, uh, one, rein them in from the state level, um, and, and two, impose some some structural reforms at the local level that that bring people more into play. So, um, you know, one of the things they did this during this last session is they said, OK, cities, counties and school districts, you guys now have to go and ask voters if you want to uh, raise property tax revenues above a certain uh, threshold. And so really, it, it was a it was a smart move to empower voters at the local level to have a, a little bit better way to rein in uh, these local governments who just want to spend and tax uh, people to death. And so, um, you know, the structural reforms and, and, and some of the, uh, some of the, you know, there, it, it, it's really a process of, of education as well, because, and, and I, I think a number of other states are, are taking this battle on as well. No, no, it's unfortunate, unfortunately, we're out of time. I mean, don't be a victim of your success. I mean, you're going to uh, attract all these companies from california and you're going to turn yourself into a purple state we need you texas we need you to defend and to promote our economic freedom james thanks for being on the show neil rich uh, thanks for having me on coming up dr roffman and i are going to have some final thoughts for the day made in america Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman. So, Rich, I mean, this is like seriously, seriously important. I mean, Texas is uh, really, I mean, you know, just like California is the is the sort of uh, anchor of the of We have the to keep Texas. Texas can't go you know, blue. You know, the moment that they lose California, it's a very, very different world for the progressives. And the same thing for Texas. Uh, for those who who love and promote economic freedom, um, entrepreneurialism, small business ownership, uh, the things that we hold dear and the things that have created the prosperity uh, in this country. Very, very important. I mean, Texas has got it going. And because of that, we're able to elect uh, national governments that are also promoting economic freedom. So vitally, vitally important. You you got the but you have you know the demographics that are changing. You, you talk about Virginia, Virginia, a reliably red state. Now with the expansion of the federal government over years and years and years, Virginia now is a blue state because they're living there, right? They don't want to. They can't live in DC. Can the Fed workers have to live you know, in, Virginia, in Virginia, Maryland. Virginia, you know, you know, it, it, amazing that Virginia, you know, has flipped. Um, you, you, it, it's a very interesting dynamic. And uh, very, very important that we stay focused on that. Well, I, I think I think Texas and, and the and the GOP knows this. The RNC knows this. They have to 
retrench and retrench and retrench in Texas. What's interesting, I find interesting in Texas, and, and I really have been doing business there since 1992, and I know a lot of the – there are so many wealthy people in Texas. I mean, the whole I – mean, think of the Hunt family, for example, in energy. So you have the Hunt and energy and doing all this stuff, and you have these people making lots and lots of money. You'd think they would want to – How about J.R. Ewing, man? They, they were pretty wealthy, they right? They did a good job, too. <laughs> exactly. And they had great-looking women. What can I tell you? But, 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 but – I, I, I just it's so difficult for me to understand and believe that they can go from a red state to a um, to a purple blue state because they they want to be able to well, they came be close. good capitalists. I mean, uh, Senator Cruz had a, the fight of his life on his hands just with Beto O'Rourke here just recently. But what's interesting is that he but was up way, against Beto and all the other media in the United States and all the other movie stars and rock and rollers in the United States, was, and he still beat him. It was Ted Cruz against he still beat every him. progressive in the country. I, I think if Beto, I think what Beto needs to do for us to win, go back on television filling a cavity. I think he needs to do that. He, he did it brushing his teeth. He had the dentist clean his teeth. He did that on television. Didn't go over well with the millennials. If he does a cavity filling or a crown, perhaps, for sure a crown, he'll never win. <laughs> you, know, you know, but but now having spoken to James just before on the show, the, one of the things I think they do need to do in Texas, and they can do in that state only, the horse vote. The horse vote. Everyone loves their horse in Texas. Let the horses vote because the <laughs> horses would be put out of business if the new Green Deal the Green New Deal goes through. You can't have a horse. The horses will vote for the Republicans. We're in. Not a problem. That's all I want to say. Well, you know, how do I how do I come back to that? I don't know. I didn't even know where that came from. But the horse vote, I think, is very important. So, moving on. Moving on. Moving Any other on. big headlines this week that's caught, caught your eye? I mean, it's been, it's been a, well, a, a pretty exciting week. It's a week. very, very interesting week. We hit a new high this week in the stock market. The Dow broke yes. 27,000. That's unbelievable. Despite the trade issues with China, it, 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 although they're talking again, it looks like uh, at least something's going on there. It looks like the Fed may uh, reduce exactly. interest rates. Another good news for entrepreneurs. They, they, they didn't come out against it. They said they're looking forward. They're thinking. They're, they're very you know positive in the sense that... You know, I love how they say, we're positively thinking. I, I love how they do that. It's just like we're going to do it. It's like we're positively thinking. Of course, you may say no, but we're positive. And then everyone goes nuts saying, oh, my God, they're going to do it. They're all excited. You know, they're all excited. I have to get back to this energy thing for a second. You know, if you think about it, if, in fact, we were to do what AOC and the others on the, the crazies on the left want us to do, Neil, that we're going to be rationing out energy. It's going to happen eventually. You're going to have brownouts and so forth. And only the elites in a communist society, in a socialist society, the elites get what they want. So the, and the others don't. If you think pilfering of cable television was bad... You know, when, when everybody wanted to have cable TV and they would figure out how to get it for free and steal it and pirate it. Watch what happens when people say, Psst, hey, you want some electric? I can do it. Because <laughs> they're going to say, well, let me think. It's 98 degrees. It's humidity. And I think I want air conditioning. I think if you think about it, this is a perfect science fiction story. Just saying. Well, a great place to end the show. Yep. Rich, I can't believe it, but we're out of time. Now, this has been a great show. This is fun today. Incredible show. This is exciting. Hey, but we're going to be back again next week for another adventure of Made in America, where we never stop fighting for your economic freedom, for your jobs, your prosperity, and for your love of this country. This is where you want to go. Made in America.